Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the final Ariel Hawani show of 2021. We have a great episode, a great conversation coming your way in a matter of moments. It's with the legendary Michelle Beadle, one of the best sportscasters in America, someone who I have admired and respected for quite some time. She recently made a big switch in her life. Um, she left ESPN a couple of years ago, but has reemerged in a big way towards the tail end of 2021. We talk about all of that and a hell of a lot more. She's a tremendous personality, and I can't wait to share this conversation with all of you. But before we get to that conversation, a quick word from two of our sponsors, and I love both of these equally. First, let me tell you about our good friends over at pristineauction.com. Now, pristineauction.com is the most trusted auction site for sports memorabilia and collectibles. I grew up collecting everything. I, I grew up collecting sports cards, autographs, memorabilia, ticket stubs, all that and more. Love these guys. They have a great site, a great service. I can't recommend them enough. You won't believe the deals that they have right now on autographs on their website, pristineauction.com. And each item comes with a certificate of authenticity from the industry's most reputable authenticators with items starting at $1 and thousands of items ending daily. You can get deals on sports cards, memorabilia, collectibles, and much more just in time for the holiday season. What's better than that? You need to get someone a gift. Holidays coming up. Perfect, perfect gift for the sports fan, the collector in your life. Now, be sure to use the registration code Helwani. That's H-E-L-W-A-N-I for $10 off your very first purchase today. Also, I want to tell you about our newest sponsor, BetterHelp. I absolutely love these guys, and I'm so excited and honored that they are part of our little engine that could here. Let me just say this right off the top. If there's something that is preventing you from being happy or achieving your goals, I want you to listen up when I tell you about the good folks over at BetterHelp. As you know, this past year has been a big one for me in terms of uh, feeling better mentally, physically, uh, talking about things that maybe have been a little taboo, getting therapy, figuring things out, becoming a healthier person mentally. And if you think you might need some help, then I want you to visit my URL at betterhelp.com slash AHS. Why? Because BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. They'll connect you in a safe and private online environment, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line, and it's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. With BetterHelp, you can send a message to your counselor anytime, receive timely and thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions just from the comfort of your home. And if money is tight, BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available so that you can connect with counselors worldwide. Best of all, anything and everything you share is 100% confidential. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener and a viewer of this program, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash A-H-S. Join over a million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash A-H-S. If you sign up, if you use BetterHelp, please let me know how it goes. I want to hear from you, and I want you to start living a healthier life. All right. Thank you very much to BetterHelp. Thank you very much to pristineauction.com. Now here's my conversation with the one and only Michelle Beadle. Enjoy. All right, so this is really exciting for me, my friends, because you know when I started out doing this particular program, one of the big things that I wanted to do was talk to people who I admire greatly, who I've watched and tried to study and uh, honestly tried to emulate and truly respect it. And at the top of that list is the great Michelle Beadle, who oh, I've God. been a fan of, yes, for quite some time. In fact, Michelle, can we go back for a second to 2013? Okay. 2013, I'm essentially a neophyte in this <laughs> business. And how about this tweet that uh, my producer just uncovered for me? I never do this. This is what I wrote. I yeah. never do this, but whatevs, with an S. <laughs> Just when this day couldn't get more exciting, I don't know what happened on this day, March 7, 2013, at Michelle D. Beadle follows me on Twitter. Oh, God. 
<laughs> wow, look at me marking out from a follow from you. How about that? And then you wrote back, anytime, not sure. It took me so long, my bad. I th I mean, I'm, I'm shocked I didn't have this laminated on my, this was a big deal for me, Michelle, that you actually knew who I was. So thank you That's for insane. that. Oh, whatever. You like came out and was like, who's this guy? This guy's like crushing. Who is this guy? It was awesome. I like when people do that. Turns your head. Yes. <laughs> so great to see you. Uh, for a minute there, we didn't know if we'd ever see you again. True. I knew you were in existence, but, uh, you know, in front of a camera, a lot has happened uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, doing Spurs broadcasts, signing this big deal to do podcasts, <laughs> what I miss with uh, the athletics. We're going to get into all of that. Uh, but first, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for coming on. I hope you're doing well. No, thank you for having me. I know we like texted a little bit over the last couple of years, and I was just like, well, I'm still hibernating. But yes. eventually I will stop hibernating, maybe. I wasn't sure if I would or not either. But I'm, yeah, it's nice to be alive again, uh, slowly but surely. I'm emerging. <laughs> 800 so or so it. days, right? You yeah. Had action. Like, that's crazy. Like saying it out loud makes it sound insane to me. Does it? It sounds like I was like gone for like three weeks. 800 <laughs> days and in the midst of, you know, a pretty crazy time in this world. Could I ask, yeah. was there ever a period during that stretch where you thought you would just never come back? I'm yes. good. I'm Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I did. But the thing was that sort of stopped that, I guess, was I... I didn't have a plan B. In fairness, I never had a plan A. So I guess that was part of it as well. But I was just like, all right, well, what will I do? And then I came back to Texas and I was like, I could drive Uber. I could wait tables again. Like I, I could do, I, I just wasn't, nothing sounded fun. And I think that's what it was. Cause the people would be like, what do you want to do next? And I legitimately, was, I have no idea. Mm. And that was that. Yeah. And so when, when you're in that period, cause you left ESPN, uh, dare I say, somewhat unceremoniously. Sure. Like sometimes when people leave, it's like the big goodbye. You do the tears, right. you do the thing. You just were there one day and you were gone one day. Right. And so I'm wondering if you had animosity towards this profession that brought you such fame and fortune, all this stuff. Like, <laughs> was there a period where you actually like hated not just sports TV, but maybe just sports in general because of the way things ended? Yeah, it's weird. Look, I had left ESPN once before, I guess a few years before that. And it was one of those awesome goodbyes. Like they shot me out of a rocket and we did a big video and it was fun and sad and we cried and it was happy and whatever. Um, and then this time around, it was just, a, I mean, a completely different animal. And it was it's not that I hated I just didn't want to do it. Like it didn't feel like I said, never planned on doing it anyways. And so doing this job for a living 99% of the time was fun. I mean, it was, it's supposed to be, it's sports, it's television, it's goofy. I, I loved everyone I worked with. Um, it never felt like work. And I just was at the end of it was like, yeah, this is kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, people are disappointing, which is fine. I'm not, I'm not 12. Like I know that. Um, and then I being away from it, being away from Twitter and social media and negativity, all of that was just such a nice feeling. Like I would wake up in the morning and not be worried about what crap somebody was going to tell me that day. It was just like, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do whatever I want. And it's going to be glorious. And that was, that got really quick. I got used to that very, very quickly, more so than I thought I would. How, how quickly does it get, like, does it take to truly cleanse your soul? Because I have said, I'm not going to check Twitter for a day. And <laughs> an hour later, I'm deep in the comments. Twitter's hard. It's because it's, so it's, it's our it's our input. It's what like I'll check it before like a game. Like anything that happens is going to be on there. So not checking it sort of handicaps us as far as what we are able to know. Um, what I have done, and I did this probably years ago, was I I turned off as much as you can, like whether it be comments from strangers or you know I don't go digging. I dare never like Google your own name. That's just mm -hmm. the number one thing you should never do. Um, things like that. Like I just stopped doing it. I think it was Bill Simmons that actually told me to do that years ago. It's like, why, why you wouldn't ever, this would never bother you out walking around. So why are you letting it bother you now? And I'm like, it's actually simply correct. Yeah. And so turning all that off was always good, but now I just don't, don't go look for it because a hundred positive things and one negative, and that's the only thing you're going to remember. And it ruins your day. And there's no point, no point at all. Why are you back in Texas? I came here in December, um, just, you know, and my dog had died and I was like, okay, I'm sad. I'm going to put all my stuff in the car and take the other two dogs and drive to Texas. And I hadn't really spoken with family for months at that point. And it was very cathartic to just be around loved ones. And around February, I realized I didn't have to go back to LA. Like the only reason I'd moved there in the first place was work. Um, it's not my home base. It's none of those things. If anything, New York city would have been the place I would have gone back to. And so being here, it just, I don't, I'm not a longtime thinker on decision-making. I'm very 
once I decided that's it. And so I, I, I just bought a house there. I put it on the market from here, sold it, bought this, boom, done, moved on. <laughs> it was very, there was no actual discussion. It was sort of, I told my best friends, I was like, what would you think about me uh, living here again? And I, you know, I haven't lived in the same city as my two best friends in over 20 years. And that was, it's still, I mean, we went to dinner last night and we still are laugh because we're like, I can't believe I'm here. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> it's so weird to be able to have dinner and see friends and, and, and nothing else. Like it's, it's a nice feeling. And I, I hope everyone gets to make that decision at some point in their lives, something that you just want to do to make you happy, not because you have to. Uh, you mentioned you didn't talk to your family for months. Was yeah. there a reason for that? Uh, I saw, you know, those last, those four years of the presidency that kind of killed a lot of relationships. Oh, for wow. a while. Really? Damn. <laughs> yeah. It got like, it got a little tense, but it's okay. I, we all have agreed to disagree on numerous things and we don't bring it up. And if somebody does, we change the subject. <laughs> okay. So you're good now. <laughs> yeah, totally fine. It is what it is. What are you going to do? <laughs> okay. Um, your dog, I believe his name was Leroy. Leroy. Yeah. That it seemed to have really hurt you. Like, yeah. It, it, I mean, yeah. It was shocking. Like I've, I've lost friends. Obviously we've all lost family. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, it's coming. It's the one thing, you know, as soon as you, you bring a dog into a pet into your life, you're like, there's going to come a day. This is going to be gone. And it just caught me off guard. I did not expect it to rock my world. And it did. And so it was all of that sort of happening at the same time was just like, poof, I'm going to go, I'm going to go somewhere else. I I'm a big fan of fresh starts, whether that's a haircut or selling and buying a different house or moving cities or changing cars, whatever, R ending a boyfriend thing, I, whatever. I, I'm a big fan and like, sometimes you got to change it up. Um, and that's, that sort of just happened for me. I didn't even really think that one out. I, I am a uh, reluctant dog owner. My brother had a dog. He didn't want the dog anymore. He gave oh it to my us. God. My, my wife said, we're just going to keep him for a week. Obviously, yeah. there was a greater plan. The dog <laughs> has been here three and a half years, and I can't help but feel every time. I love this dog. Like I sure. truly love this dog. Her name is Macha, and uh, I always think I think about that. I don't know how I'm going to handle it's that. It's awful. Yeah, it's awful. It I is think about it all the time. Yes, it's horrible. All the time. It's I, I, the two pugs I have still are both older. Like they're you know probably fourteen ish and maybe thirteen ish. Who knows? Every time there's a cough or a sneeze or a, or if they're breathing or if they're sleeping for a long time, I go check. It's such a morbid existence. Um, it's realistic and it is what it is. But at the end of the day, no, like giving dogs the best life they could possibly have, especially senior dogs, if you can, is such a beautiful feeling because it makes me happier than it probably makes them. And so, yeah, it really sucks and it really hurts, but it's all part of loving something or someone. And so, you know. Now, will I do any of this again? That I don't know. <laughs> That's the different subject altogether. Are you done moving? Is this your oh, final stop? God, I mean, I can never, I can never say that, can I? Like, I'd like to think it is. I feel very content, which is a better version of happy. I think. Um, you know, I love, I, I have a, I have a boyfriend here, and I reconnected with someone after like twenty years, and yeah, I just, it's calm. Now, if I were to move again, I don't think it would be one of these, I hope, like rash, I'm out of here kind of things, but who can know? I mean, there's still the UK bed and breakfast dream that's lingering over mm. my head all the time. I, I want to live out like a rom-com someday, but not the, the love part, just the bed and breakfast part. <laughs> Weren't you actually over there for a while? Um, I was. Were you living yeah, there or I, just was, visiting? I like to think I was living. I was living in a hotel. It was like my best, you know, nine or two and oh dream, but it, wow. it was, yeah, my dream, that was actually the plan was once I sort of was away for a minute, I was just going to start traveling and I started it. And then when I came back here, it wasn't that long after that, that everything sort of shut down and the world made decisions for all of us. And so that, that was kind of the end of that. But yeah, I, I, I would love that. I love the idea of sort of traveling and living out of a suitcase for a while and not having, you know, actually doing it for fun and not, not work related. So you're actually living in a singular hotel or multiple hotels? No, I was living in a hotel. Wow. Um, got to know, Where? got to know the staff. It was in in London in Mayfair. Okay. Um, and I would take like day trips, or I, you know, I'd go. It was I never left it, but I would go to you know Liverpool for a night, or I'd go up to Scotland for a few days. Like it was just yeah, it was over Christmas and New Year's, and it was. I think once I took my first fun trip by myself, like you sort of break that seal. Uh, it changes the whole game. It's the first one though, that you're very nervous about. And you're just like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Like I'm by myself. This is weird. Am I even going to do it? And then you embrace it. And I'm a nerd. So I love tours and not everyone loves tours. So when you travel by yourself, 
it's tours every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody can make fun of you or say no, or I'm tired. Uh, and it was, yeah, I, I, I loved it. I love being there. It's, it's a New York, but with a much like a chiller vibe. You ever get recognized there? Once. Uh, and, but it was actually, it wasn't there. It was, it was in Switzerland and it was Americans. Um, and it was the most random. I was in a small bar, uh, watching soccer and I was probably one of three women in this whole bar and, and that, and it happened. And then one guy was like, we actually met like a million years ago. And it was just such a crazy out of context. Cause I'm really bad with recognizing people, especially out of context. Um, and that, and that happened and it ended up turning into like this super fun night with kind of strangers, but not really. So it was good. <laughs> what is it like for someone in your positions, you know, psyche, and maybe even ego as well? Like you are omnipresent on the biggest network in America slash the world. You're a part of the NBA finals, that stuff. And then the next day, literally, almost literally, you are not there and you right. are nowhere to be found. Um, I, I would imagine not only is that a different way of living your life, but it's got, I mean, is there it's something different. going on? Yes. Yeah, it's different. Well, look, like we all have egos. Like the, yes. the any, everybody has an ego, first of all. And then you throw your face on one of these stupid screens and then the ego all of a sudden blows up. You don't even know why. It's a weird thing. It's like you, you don't think you're anything special, but then sometimes people tell you you're something special and it seeps in a little. I have no idea. Um, two or three years ago, or no, and now four or five years ago, version of me would have just been devastated. I would have immediately gone back to work. I would have just done whatever job, anything, right? I think because I did what I did and I reached what I wanted to reach and I, I was financially good, like I think all of that combined really let me relax because I had worked so hard for so many years. And there were, there were years where I was doing seven days a week, random, you know, Sports Nation for five days and then this and this. And I had never really taken a break break from it. And it was, yeah, I didn't care if I was seen again because it was on my own terms. You know, I think had I been fired or had it been uh, just a little bit different of an ending, maybe I would have been a little more angry or a little more feeling like I got to get out there and do this and do that. But I, it just, it was like a breakup. It's like when you break up, you walk away. Cool. You have a clean conscience. You're like, did what I did, said what I said everybody's moving on. And that's kind of how I felt about it. And I also, it was my dream job for a while and I did it and it's good. Like I, I yeah, it was good. And I know we did a good show and I, I rest thinking that. And so it, it was almost like the best case scenario for leaving something like that rather than jumping back into something else that you just didn't even want to do. In the immediate aftermath, is there any sadness, depression? How are you handling it? Um, I'm trying to think like, I didn't even really watch I didn't really watch sports for a pretty good year other than, you know, going over there and, and watching soccer and all that. But it was, I didn't watch, well, I wasn't going to watch the NBA bubble stuff. Like to me, that was, I, I just didn't get it. <laughs> I was like, it's pointless. Uh, so that was easy. Didn't, nothing ever bothered me um, because, and you probably know this feeling. Like, you know what goes on behind the scenes at places, right? Like, you know, like you, everyone's watching a show at a bar at their home and that's, it is what they see. It's face value. But we also know like the good stuff that happens, the bad stuff that happens, specifically the people that are maybe doing things behind the scenes. Like, you know, all that. And that's a peaceful thing too, because it's not always all it's cracked up to be. And it's, you know, we had a great run because our group, like our little group, whether it be Sports Nation or NBA Countdown, it was a good group of people. And I think that also helped. My my issues were not within that group at all. Everything that I had an issue with was outside of that immediate group. And so, you know, even if I would catch something or I'd watch something, it didn't bother me. It was, I'm telling you, I, I shocked myself because me years ago version would have been miserable. I would have probably scoured the internet for like, People, with, what are they? Is anyone even saying anything about me? Does anyone right. know I'm still like you know that kind of crap? Um, and I'm so glad that I didn't do or this none of this happened during that version of me because that would have that just would not have been peaceful. I would have probably done some dumb jobs by now just to do what just get on TV. Like no, that's it. It all worked out. I'm not a religious person. I'm not I'm not uber suit. I'm not spiritual anything. But somehow, some way, this all happened the way it did for a reason. Like I tr- I truly believe that timing was good. Did anyone help you not do that? Like, did you talk to someone? Did you talk to a therapist? Did you talk to no. anyone? You did no. it all on your own. No, and I really, it's it sucks. You know, my agent at the time left for WWE, Nick Khan. My um, agent too. 
right? So like, so that happened. So that was, I, that wasn't a choice we made. Uh, my manager at the time, we had not a great breakup, which sort of was a little shocking because we had been friends and, but that also happens. That's part of the business. So I think, and this is just me thinking, I think because every piece of the, that industry was removed from my life. Like I no longer really was connected to it. I think Ramona Shelburne was the only person that I would sometimes like peep into my texts and remind, end up like, Ramona, I don't want to know about this right now. I'm good. And so she was, and she was great. I think because I was so far removed myself from it all, I didn't need anything. It was, it was like, I just needed to be away for it. And then when I was ready, I would come back slowly, <laughs> really, really slowly. Jeez. In in retrospect, uh, do you do you regret the decision to join Get Up? No, no, that decision uh, was good for my bank account. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. Fair but also, enough. like, look, what what we signed up to do under John Skipper, Greedy, and I, and everybody else that picked up and moved back to New York or to New York, was very much like a show that we all wanted to do. And then, you know, and then people leave, things get changed. Other people come into in charge and it becomes something else. And so that's okay. The studio was beautiful. I love living in New York more than I've ever loved anywhere else. It was great to be able to do everything in one spot, but when things sort of change behind the scenes and you, you can remove yourself, like why be miserable? There's, mm. there's no point. Life's too short. So you had that uh, somewhat infamous moment where you said you don't watch football. <laughs> yeah. I was always wondering if you said that to try to get off the show. And no, because you want to know why I didn't think anything of it. I had been saying that on Sports Nation for oh. like two years before. And then I thought, wow, no one's actually listening to anything I say. That's humbling. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was because if you really, I mean, look, if you think back to what I said, how it was really not that big a deal, but there's such a, and, and also who gives a damn? Like if this one chick on TV doesn't want to watch football, A, doesn't mean I still don't know what's going on. Probably more so than some people who claim to watch every week. And B, and we're supposed to all be different. We're supposed to all have different opinions. I, at the time, represented a certain amount of humans that felt the same way I did, that some of the issues that the NFL chose to address and not address were insulting to groups of us. And so that's how I felt. I felt angry. And that's okay. When you love something or you're a fan of something, like we all are for sports, you're allowed to be hurt, offended, angry. That's part of it. Otherwise, we're just mindless robots. And, you know, that doesn't sound like a fun way to live anyway. So, yeah, I had no idea because I had already said that before in my life that that was going to resonate the way that it did. I mean, to this day, people are, like, are, you, are you watching football? I'm like, holy crap. Like, how is that the one thing that everyone, man, you think you say some really smart things over the years and then you realize it just all came down to one sentence. <laughs> But I have to be honest, like I was shocked that that was such a big thing uh, to your point, because if you kind of take it out of context, OK, it's a little bit shocky. But like, was that was that ever told to you? No, you are being removed from this show. But it happened no. shortly thereafter, right? Yeah, it happened shortly thereafter. And they kept changing things. And look, behind the scenes now, I, now I can talk about it all the time. But behind the scenes with Nick and everything, I, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. There are people that are in charge of the show that are ruining it and making it what it's not supposed They're making it in every other show. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, you have this amazing studio in this amazing location in the greatest city in the world. And we did all of this work and now you're just gonna make it into whatever everything else is. And so that was kind of the thing. And, and already having NBA countdown anyways, it made it an easy sort of conversation. And look, let's not be, I, Norby Williamson is all too happy to get rid of me. And I'm all too happy to be out of his life and his out of mine. So that was easy. That was an easy like, hey, we want out. Can we get out? Boom, boom, done. <laughs> let's all move on with our lives um it's weird it's like i know this isn't a good lesson for kids like if you don't like something leave but also as a 46 year old who wants to enjoy life i that's where i am now if i don't like something i'm going to try to leave it or do something else fighting for it when you know you can't win is it's it's pointless do you ever watch the show now i've seen it a few times and i've heard from greenie uh, like greenie's a lovely man we, our personalities could not be more different. I am noxious and loud and he is not, he is, he is like a dream for hosting television because he doesn't get you in trouble. He's never going to, he's not going to say anything controversial, even if I never thought I said anything controversial. And so, yeah, he's, he's a good person. And I, I see it every once in a while. Like when I come in here, I'll, I'll have the TV on and it'll be muted. Um, but for the most part, to be honest, I don't watch a lot of talking head television. I watch games. Uh, I obviously will watch you know, Ernie Johnson and those guys, but that's, that's kind of it. Like, I think 
you, when you gave opinions for a living, whether people wanted to hear them or not, I don't really listen to other people's opinions. Do listen to a lot of Sirius XM radio. That's probably where I consume the most. So the, I feel like there's a little bit of revisionist history because I feel like some people now think that the end of your time at ESPN was with that show, but you still right. stuck around and you were a part of Countdown and whatnot. Oh, yeah. What was it like afterwards, post Get Up, when you were just doing Countdown? Did you feel like your days were numbered in, in your mind? No, I, well, not in that sense, um, because the show for the first time in its existence, it'd be a countdown. Like we actually rated OK. Like we had some shows that were competing, whereas before it, it just wasn't. Um, anyway, it doesn't help that they change it every season, but that, that is what it is. And so, no, I just I for me, it started um, the playoffs of my final season, whatever that was. And I'll never forget it because it was in Portland at the time. And I just it was just ruined. Like the, the project that it was, the fun that it was, it was just ruined from just garbage that didn't need to be ruining anything actually at that point. And it, it, you know, I knew I was okay with that. And I knew Chauncey and I am like Paul as serious as Paul can be. Like we would talk about it, Jalen, you know, it was, I was very open about how I felt and the things that were happening and all that with them and with everyone on the show. But yeah, I just was sort of like, you know, I have a contract. If I can get out, we'll get out as long as I don't get screwed. And then I don't really care what happens after this, but we'll finish out the season and see what happens. <laughs> so what, 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 what was ruined? It was a, like, it's just such a television. You know, I hate cliches. Like I hate the idea of like, well, whoa, television's a cutthroat industry and backstabbing. You know? And you're like, no, not really. I mean, I really never experienced much of that. It, I, like, sure, you have issues with certain individuals, but that you would have had that if you worked at a grocery store. Like, we just don't always have to like everybody and they don't have to like us. But there are other things that start to happen. And, and there's this sort of like, you know, people will use media. They will say things to media knowing that it will get printed, whether it be on the internet or in paper or whatever, that they know are not, it's not right. Um, but you find some, you find that one person who's willing to do it and you can put somebody in a bad light. You can paint me in a bad light. You can tell stories that aren't true to make yourself look better. And that's fine. That's everyone's prerogative if that's how you play. But when it's allowed to happen repeatedly, um, that didn't make sense to me because here you have this company, you've invested a ton of money in me. You'd think that at least while I'm there, you you sort of have my back or publicly have my back or what have you. And that's just not how it works. And it's a it's a bummer because I think what happens in those cases is less talented or less able people end up doing jobs because they played that kind of a game. And then you have a crappier product, but it is what it is. You don't do you have to feel watch it. like ESPN, the environment, do you feel like it fosters that kind of behavior? Do you feel like it 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 fosters that kind of insecurity, jealousy, backstabbing, being in the, you know, the ecosystem, as they call it, that is ESPN. Do you, <laughs> right. Do you feel like it fosters it? I mean, look, I've only ever worked as far as that's concerned, like at NBC for a minute. And it was, mm -hmm. it was sort of a up and coming sports network at that point. It was not, it's nowhere close to what ESPN is. And so I had so many good years at ESPN without anything. You know, we, I started in 09, did however many years, took a break and went back. Um, and it was great. And now look, whether things were happening, maybe I just didn't know about it or maybe it never came to me or I didn't hear about it. But I also never did a show that was as you know visible as NBA Countdown. And so that's probably part of it as well. There's just one job, that one hosting job is the only one that exists and people want it. And so they, I guess some people are just willing to do whatever it takes to get it. It's, it's a weird it's a weird way to live. Like I, I, I sometimes think about like, should I have done this or should I have played the game or should I have gone to the media and leaked a bunch of BS and see what, but then I think what a, what a crappy way. Like I still have to go to bed at night. I still have to wake up tomorrow. I would feel awful if I knew that I made a lie about someone else and then that got spewed out. So I don't know. I'd rather have a clean conscience about it than, than have that job and feel gross and dirty. So officially, was your last uh, your last assignment for ESPN? Was it Game Six of the 2019 NBA Finals? Was it Raptors Warriors? Was yes. that the last time you were on air? Yes, that was it. When, when you signed off, did you know that was it? Yes, I knew. Yeah, you knew. I didn't. Really? I didn't know officially, but I knew that I we had behind like Dick and our people, or my people, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. We had already been like, all right, look. I'm technically had another year on my deal, but if there was a way, if there was a breach, if there was even a hint that like somehow my contract was going to get stepped on, 
then I had an out to get money and leave. Because look, I can leave, but you leave without money. So wow. you need to like, you have to cover yourself. So I would have had to stay another year, but we, we got lucky on that. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. I've never heard of a deal like that before. Yeah. Because if I would just, you know, like, you can quit a job whenever you feel like it, but you don't get anything. Right. Like, <laughs> they're like, okay, cool. Thanks for having me. But I didn't want to do that. Like, look, the last thing I'm going to do is give, let people keep money that I had signed on for. Like, that's just not how it works. Like, I'm a friendly person and decent to get along with, but I'm not I'm taking my money with me. <laughs> that's the one thing I draw the line at. So <laughs> there you go. Did they try to convince you to stay? Did anyone try to convince you to stay? At first they were like, okay, well you could, or you could just stay out the year, but it, it was, it was broken. Like it was just a broken relationship because the garbage that was still going on, that, that was still going to go on. Uh, things had already been said about me publicly that weren't true, that nobody squashed or fixed or, and I never addressed any of it. And so it just sort of felt like, I don't want to do anything for any of this. You know, Chauncey was leaving. Uh, I didn't know Paul was going to leave in the way that he left, but God uh -huh. couldn't have been more Paul. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, again, like it's a, it was a brand new show a few months later, different people, different everything. And it, that's how it works. Just changes. You referenced uh, Ernie Johnson inside the NBA. Uh, I think most people would agree that probably the greatest studio show of oh, all time, right? Easily. Yeah. It's not a hot take. Um, <laughs> no. Why have they had so much success and ESPN literally almost every year changes that crew? Why can't they even get anything near the kind of success in chemistry that yeah. those guys have had? Well, look, chemistry is very rare that you put together a panel show and in the first year, you don't, you just don't get it. That's not how chemistry works. You might get chemistry, but they, they have let these guys marinate for years and years and years and years. Those four guys, like they couldn't possibly probably know each other any better. I mean, they, they give them freedom. They, I mean, and when I say freedom, they give them freedom. Like mm -hmm. that's the hard thing about it. They have a lot more time. Like the, the countdown show is so packed. It's like, I think by the time it's all said and done with commercial breaks and everything, you get like 11 minutes of, of, of content time, which is hard. That's not a lot of time, especially when you've got three or four people trying to divide that up. And so the it's, it's trusting the people that you hired to make the show in the first place. It's, trusting that they know what they're doing that you know you don't have to bow to every time the phone rings to change everything like you just have to let the people you hire to do things do those things and i don't know why that's not been the case for many many times over i, I have no idea because it's not that hard it's nba it's people talking about nba people who probably love watching nba and that should be easy and so yeah that tnt is I mean, it, it's just, it's effortless and it, and you watch them. And if you're watching at home, you probably think they just show up five minutes before and they go out there and Ernie's just the best traffic cop that ever was. And, and it looks easy and it's not, as we all can tell. And it's a bummer because it should be, I think. Uh, I would have loved to have uh, spoken to you, heard your thoughts in the midst of last year when all the drama with Countdown was going on. <laughs> uh, I, I know you you tweeted something quite cryptic about it. I think you were referring to that. Karma's a bitch. <laughs> it well, is what honestly, it is. <laughs> what, what were your thoughts? Come on. Oh, I loved us. it. Well, it's, it, that's nothing. That person, that's what she does. And so that was nothing. She did stuff to me. Like she's the one that did all the stuff. Like she's the one that plays that game. And, uh, you know, to watch the both of them sort of engage in the media wars. I don't, look, I don't think either one came out looking great. Uh, it was just not good look for either one of them, but it's also, it wasn't shocking to any of us in that business. Like when you heard the names and who did what you were just like, yeah, that's about right. Mm. And I, and for me personally, yeah, <laughs> that was, yeah, that's, were you taxes. sitting back like loving it or like, what, I what didn't even the... know at first. You didn't know. What do you mean? No, Where I, were you? I, like I, I was, you know, I was living, but I don't, I was trying to remember who texted me first about it. Maybe I just wasn't like on the internet or something as right. much, but yeah. And then I went on there. I was like, Oh, that's, Oh, that's funny. And so, yeah, that was, yeah, I just, I mean, you know, you know, you have to remember like somebody leaked it and somebody taped yeah. it and somebody, you know, people don't do that when they like you. So maybe we take an inner look at ourselves. Could I ask, how do you feel like the company handled it? <sighs> that was a tough one, but like, I am a person who knows that they, they had chances to handle that way before that moment. Um, they had chances to tell certain people not to behave certain ways and they didn't take that chance. It's like a child. You tell that child, you know, when you're eight, 
that you stop acting like this, then hopefully by the time they're 12, you don't really have that issue anymore. But when you allow that child to continue to do and do and do, whether you, because you don't want the confrontation, you don't want the headache, then don't be surprised. There's no reason why a person stops the bad behavior if no one's telling them to. There's no punishment, there's no repercussions. And so, yeah, it, it was, that was there. They kind of made their bet on that one. And then that's why I think everybody came out looking awful. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the current iteration of Countdown? I don't, I haven't, uh, I haven't really seen, I know it's greedy splitting mm -hmm. it or not splitting it. Yeah, I think he's splitting it with uh, Michael Eves and there's uh, Stephen oh, okay. A. Smith involved. Love and well, of uh, course, Michael it's, it's ESPN project. <laughs> Michael Wilbon. <laughs> Love involved. Wilbon. Uh, yeah, I mean. And Jalen. Oh, duh. Yeah, I knew. I did yeah. know Jalen. Um, yeah, it, it's. <laughs> I guess it's there. I don't yeah. really watch half times of anything. I try to right. do other stuff. But yeah, it's. It, those are, for the most part, nice people. I have no issue with them personally. It's just. Yeah, I don't know. And I love Eves. Like if Eves is doing stuff, I'll watch Eves doing stuff because I think he's awesome. But yeah, that's it's just again, it's just another change. And then I don't know what happens. Could I ask what was your relationship like with Stephen A? I don't have one with him. I don't want to ever. Yeah. Why? Um, we just are very different people. We're different how we treat people, we're different how we view things. Uh, and that's cool. Like I said. I don't have to like everyone and I certainly don't expect everyone to like me. And I think that's a, probably a good example of someone who he and I are just, we're like over here. Mm -hmm. uh, in your life now, it must be nice. Like you sometimes in, in TV, you have to work with people who you don't necessarily yeah. like. Yeah. It must be nice now. I, I feel like you like everyone that you work with now. Isn't that like yeah. a beautiful thing? It's probably been it a is. long time in your adult professional life that you've actually liked everyone that you work with. Well, I like, no, that's the thing I, I liked it. Cause if you think of who I've worked with, I, I work with starting with Colin Cowherd and LZ and Marcellus and Max, and then Jalen and Chauncey and Paul. And, you know, I never worked with Stephen A on camera. That was, I, I wouldn't, um, oh, I wow. don't have a good, I don't have a good enough poker face to be honest with you. And the funny story about that is the last day that I did get up as I'm sitting at the desk with Greeny and Greeny has to read the read for the next coming up show that I'm already, I'm not going to be on immediately that following morning it was and tomorrow Stephen a smith joins us <laughs> mm. and i was just like i actually think somebody sent me a screen grab of my face because i was like laughing it, like in a weird way um so yeah no i do i like but look i came back here and i'm working with spurs and it's for the most part almost everyone there is people that i've known for decades like it's 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 either they were still there or they were there when i was an intern or they've been there for the last 10 to 12 years and i've i've known them through that it's it's just a nice family vibe. Um, I feel like somebody's daughter who returned home because it's always, they're very nice and welcoming and they don't have to be. And it's, it's just been, it's been great. Like, I don't feel like I'm on edge or have to worry about anything stupid. It's just go to work, enjoy yourself, go home, live your life. Uh, I want to ask you about the Spurs thing in a second, but one last thing on ESPN, uh, you revealed recently, which uh, you created all these headlines, the LeBron James thing <laughs> that he wanted to get you fired. And I don't, you don't need to necessarily get into all that. However, <laughs> I sympathize with you greatly because I too was at ESPN. I don't know if you know this. We didn't really yeah. coincide, although you did break the news that I was going to ESPN. I don't know if you know this. Wait, how did it? Oh, wait, from, yeah, from MMA? I, I was on Get Up. Yeah. And I just was on as a guest. I hadn't even... Yes. Been, and you said welcome to the family or something and yes. then i think the big lead picked up on that and started snooping around and uh, actually you Damn expedited it. the process so no i appreciate it it was really nice of you i mean <laughs> really it was kind of PR. full circle from the uh from the twitter uh, exchange that you That's were the funny, one to actually. break the news um in any event uh, from before my first day there but after signing there was a fairly uh, influential figure in my world that tried to get me fired as well from ESPN yeah uh, his name Dana White so yeah. you know you had LeBron I had Dana what was it look like at us but, yeah you see you know, like, <laughs> we both kind of survived we're doing okay we're all right but it's it's not uh, I knew he was trying to get me fired did you yeah. know or is this something you learned only afterwards I learned after I learned uh, after uh, that's a lot better this meeting or whatever happened I, I like I didn't even, I thought it was stupid. I was like, that's why, why would anyone care who's doing what? Um, but yeah, I learned after the fact, do you get this thing now where people are like, whatever, dude, you're just saying that for attention that never happened. And you just want to be like, why would I, why, who makes that up? Like, that's a stupid thing to make up. The last thing I want to spend the rest of my life doing is talking about LeBron James. So sure. really it's, that's, it is what it is. I sat with it for two years. I didn't say a word about it. I answered a few questions in the last month or so. And it is what it is. Like, <laughs> it's, it's how close was he being it. successful? I don't know I, because I, look at the end of the day, I didn't even care. It wasn't that he, the request was made. It was that no one said, 
hey, look, we're having this, we like doing work with you, blah, 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 but that's not your, it's not your area. Like we, mm -hmm. that's, we'll take care of that. That's what bothered me. Mm -hmm. I don't care what he said. It's that no one in that room had the, the balls to be like, that's our hire. That's our person for now. She's our, our pick and you know, none of your business. And it didn't get said. And that's a bummer. And I couldn't agree. That, that's the main thing. <laughs> loyalty, right? Like people exactly. not having your back is the stuff that means the Everything. most that hurts the most. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and have you heard from his team since you put no, this I, out there? No, I never, I never will. I'm sure they'll just, I'm sure they think, oh, she's crazy. That ever happened. Right, but right, right. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a person who makes a habit of lying. That's just, I, you know, I don't bother saying it if it's not true. <laughs> so the 800 days, how close were you to coming back sooner? How, I mean, maybe the pandemic helped, but like, were you, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people threw a lot of things your way. In fact, someone even called me one time. I don't know if you know this. And in, cause when I left ESPN, I was, you know, fielding a lot of stuff, independent yep. Helwani. Uh, someone actually pitched me a radio show with you. <gasps> Why did know we this? do that? No. They said did... you were on board and, uh, well, I would be, but well, <laughs> like, why didn't we do that? I don't know. It just, I, it didn't happen, but I find it kind of weird now that you didn't know about it. Cause they said Beatles on board and we're looking for the, the sidekick and would you be interested? And then huh. the, doesn't know, that make you wonder though, all the things that maybe you weren't told about, like yeah. what else was I not told about? <laughs> that's, that's bothersome a little I think bit. I could have made a good team. <laughs> oh, we would. Yeah. Well, we still can. We're not dead. That's true. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious, like how close were you to coming back sooner? No, I mean, I was, and you're right. Like the pandemic certainly made, I probably would have come back um, maybe a year, a whole year earlier if there wasn't a pandemic, but that pandemic, it was like, it was a procrastinator's dream. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it was great because it's awful and it's still going, but it was for personal reasons. It was like, well, I don't have to go back to work then. There's no rush. There's nobody's hiring. Why would I even bother looking? Like it was perfect. And it just sort of added a year very sneakily and quietly onto what was already going to be a bit of a break. <laughs> so the, the, the part that I love so much about your return is you first emerge on the Spurs broadcast and there's like something so... Uh, how can I say there's something so beautiful and innocent about that? Because you literally <laughs> are going home, right? Like right. you're going to where your, your favorite team, your, your, your home state, your, you know, like where you kind of started your career, all that stuff. How does that even happen? And, and it's, and I give you a lot of credit because I think there's a lot of people who have a big enough ego who would say like, Oh, I'm not going to go back to local totally. sports. Right? right. I was on ESPN. How did that come about? You reach out to them. They reach out to you. How I mean, it was happen? sort of like a, like, um, you know, when I did come back to town and I knew I was staying, you know, I just like, I'm still friends with Daniel and kick and the producers and Tom James. Uh, and, you know, I was like, Hey bitches, guess who moved back to San Antonio? Uh -huh. And it was sort of like one of those. And like, we joked about it. I was like, well, if you guys need like a, like a intern or cause that, <laughs> that was my last job there. And then I'm not even sure what the, it was almost like months later, like how serious are you? Like, would you want to do something? And I was like, yeah, what would you like me to do? And, and we went and had dinner and we had talks about it and they were awesome. I mean, it was, it went from like, you could do as much as you want or as little as you want, or, you know, and I, and it just, it was a no brainer. Now the ego thing. Um, yeah. Again, I think the slightly older version of me, or I guess younger technically might have thought that, but it's first of all, when you think about that, what an ass thing to think, right? Like, mm. how dare I walk back into this world that A, gave me the, the doors open to everything that I did after that. B, this is a beautiful life that everyone enjoys here and they choose to be here. And they, you know, they've been doing play by play for so many years and it is a family. And then what, I'm going to walk in here and poop on that because it's not whatever I think it's supposed to be. No, I, I don't. It doesn't feel like that. Like it feels, it feels sometimes like I'm intruding. Like oh, these guys have been doing this for so long. I don't want them to be like, who is this jackass? Like da da da. And and yeah, and it's just no. And and I'll be honest with you, every game that I go to, it, the the fans themselves that are walking around the mezzanine and could not be kinder mm -hmm. or, or more welcoming. And so, yeah, if there was a moment like that or an ego thing, uh, it never really came to fruition. Not not this time. Like five years ago, I'm sure. I'm sure I would have been a douche about all of it <laughs> so what is the deal how many how many games do you do for them so i do it comes out to like maybe one a week and i think okay. we're gonna start like tomorrow night i'm gonna start i want to start doing stuff with the players um it's a young like just a hungry group of guys that genuinely seem to like each other which is nice to see and so yeah we're gonna start 
you know, a lot of them are, they're not household names and they all have fun personalities. So we'll start getting that out there a little bit more, but yeah, it's like a, it's like a game a week and it's, I mean, it, it couldn't be easier or more fun. <laughs> And I'm assuming you had many suitors for this podcast that you're mm. doing. Uh, you ultimately went with The Athletic. Why them? Well, you know, being the serious journalist that I yeah. am. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, I think that's why, to be honest with you, because I, it is the monopoly on like journalists. Like it's, it, they have such a, a stable of really good writers and people who are taken seriously. And then for them to even be interested in me, I was just kind of like, really? Uh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And then they give me this opportunity to like, I can make other podcasts and I can, we can try to find the next great person that can do this. And so, yeah, it was, yeah, it was weird. The podcast world is crazy to me. I still, it's still bizarre. Like I sit in this little chair and I'm like, how is this a job? Like what's, I don't get it. It's I'm going to get it maybe hopefully sooner rather than later, but yeah, it's, it's different. It is different. It's harder than TV. I know that way harder. I was listening to an interview recently with uh, Jackie McMullen, the legend, um, with the great Dan Lebitard, and uh, she was talking about, you know, some of her early days and the stuff that she had to deal with in locker (laughs) rooms and people not letting her in. Your gig, obviously, a little bit different, but when you were coming up, did you feel a little bit unwanted? Did you feel, did did you get mistreated because you were a woman in a very male dominated world? I wouldn't say I got mistreated. Um, Look, there are always going to be a couple people or, or you know, so, certain things you hear. Um, I, I remember, I God, I remember I was like technically still an intern here. Like I hadn't even started, started yet. And they were gave me the opportunity to host like some pregame stuff during the Western Conference finals. And so I'm down there on the sidelines and it just, it's just all very surreal because I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm almost too ignorant that that's probably how it worked out. And I remember there was a, a long time. And now I know Los Angeles broadcaster down there. And I remember him making sort of a, a snide comment about like, well, if I look like that, they probably, and I, a, I don't fancy myself as like the beautiful girl at the party. So a, I was like, well, that's nice. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then B, I realized like, oh no, he said it in kind of a crappy way. And I don't know anything. And I don't even know that that's going to be my career. Like I'm just trying something new and see if I like it. There've been a couple moments like that, but really it's not been that bad. I mean, locker rooms are uncomfortable. Like I I never liked going to locker rooms. Unfortunately, that's just the only way things were done for a long time. And so it is what it is. Nobody wants anybody in the locker room, newsflash, man or woman. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. where they're trying to get dressed and go about their business and have their day. And so, yeah, it's, I don't remember a time when anybody specifically made me feel bad or maybe I just didn't it didn't resonate enough for me to remember it in that way which probably isn't true because I remember a lot of things that a lot of people say and so that wasn't it I never felt it other than Floyd Mayweather of course yeah (laughs) yeah but I'm I'm a long list of people that we don't have to care for (laughs) yeah the (laughs) the official story is they did they another thing that I sympathize with you with because it's happened to me uh (laughs) Did they like revoke your credentials from that? What is the official story there? That was what that, that's what happened. And then, um, cause we were in Vegas that whole week leading up, uh, for sports nation. I was also kind of mood lighting with HBO boxing doing, I did like an interview for the show that Max did and, and, um, Lampley Mm -hmm. and somewhere, I don't remember what day it was, but it was leading into the weekend. Like I was supposed to be there through the whole thing and went to go get credentials. And my manager was called and was like, there's no credential. Like they, they pulled it. And I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, well, they're just, they don't, they're not going to give you a credential. You can't go to the fight, which I'm like, sweet. You know, I, I lived in LA. I'd driven up. I was like, I'm going home. And it was just like, well, wait, wait. And then they tried to like, when this went public, because like Rachel Nichols also had the same thing when that went public, um, people started to backtrack. Like, I think his people were like, that's not true, da, da, da. But it, like, there was never, I think there were even like boxing, like there's a boxing guy at ESPN at the time, maybe still is, who was like, that's not true. And I don't know, maybe he has to carry the water for them. I'm not sure, but I had no credential. And that is okay. the bottom line. Like, and then once they were like, oh no, no. well, I'm, I'm already in the car on the way back. Like, oh, it is, okay. it's fine. Yeah, like that, it was pulled. And that's funny to me because again, who cares what a few people say? Right. We're not the only ones saying it. There are a bunch of people that say it. You can't only surround yourself with ass kissers. That's weird. Of course. Uh, the fight game likes those people, unfortunately. Did, did you ever get an apology for that? No, no, no. 
I don't know because they, they denied it. And so that's, you know, everyone's sticking to their guns, I guess. Why, when did it happen to you or has it happened a million times? Oh, uh, well, it very famously happened to me in our little world back at UFC 199, which was uh, 2016, June of 2016. I was at the forum in Inglewood um, mm -hmm. and I broke a story. I mean, the relationship between me and the UFC and in particular Dana White was uh, deteriorating, shall right. I say? <laughs> And uh, I broke a story that Brock Lesnar was coming back at UFC 200, and uh, I was asked to go to the back, and uh, I said no a few times, and then finally they said, you must go to the back, and then uh, they they removed me from the building. He he was there and said I was banned for life, and that Damn. they just put a bullet in my head, and that my career would be over, and all this crazy stuff. Wow, it turned dark. into a big story. Yes, it was dark, especially <laughs> coming from, you know, Vegas guys, but uh, two <laughs> days later... They they rescinded the band because the fans like yeah. revolted in my honor. You're good so at this. Like cool. you're you're a trusted voice, and if you start shutting up the trusted voices, then what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You can't do that. That's a those, there's a word for that. <laughs> like, but wait, what was the pro? Was it that Brock was coming back and they didn't? What was oh, the they said I ruined the surprise. The surprise. I was being selfish. I was that's uh, why doing my job. And I actually remember. Yes, that was why. And uh, so the conversation was supposed to only last four seconds it was supposed to be like take off your credential you're out you'll never be back here and uh i was like well what's the difference between what i just did and what Schefter or woge do yeah. right i literally said that i broke the story i was right what did i do wrong uh you 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 ruined the surprise we had been working on this i was like so this is why i'm gone like for this um and so that's actually the last time i spoke to him um and then so when i signed with espn two years later 2018 he was unhappy tried to yeah. get me out and part of the reason why i'm no longer at espn <laughs> but see that's all ego because you didn't say anything wrong you didn't mm. bash anyone you it wasn't like a personal attack you just literally did your job but it's i think that's maybe where mma crosses over into like a wwe vibe like just the the show of it all is what bothered yes. him like i guess yes. yeah because that's you're right like woge and chef will break some like damning news and then everyone looks bad, but like, that's not even. <laughs> that's just <laughs> that transactional. Even... Yeah. That is literally transactional. That's this guy signed with this guy. By the way, uh, are you still a wrestling fan? I have, so I've tuned in a few times since. Um, like, I forgot what I watched most recently. The, the women are just all badass. I did see that CM Punk went back to, you know, which I thought was like, that was a huge. W. Yeah. yeah, that was huge. Uh, yeah, so it's it's been, it's kind of fun to like kind of tune in and, I don't know if I'll ever watch every single thing like I used to, but I'll, I'll tune in when I do. And it's, it's still entertaining. <laughs> you used to be like tight with CM Punk, right? Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, why, life is so weird. Like, yeah. you know, it's, if you think friendships and stuff like that are easy, but then all of a sudden, you know, as an adult, you're just like, how, why aren't we friends anymore? What happened? Like, I don't even know what happened, but that's okay. Nobody, nobody suffered. Um, forgive me for this personal question, but I'm just wondering, does Michelle Beadle want to have a family? No, I mean, she, like human, like human babies. Yeah. <laughs> no, God, no. No interest. <laughs> no, I never did. I, I was like six years old when I told my mom that I was like, mom, can I wow. get an operation? So I never have kids. <laughs> I, wow. I'm not a, I've just never been, I've never even felt it. I've never seen it that I, and I went, Oh, I, that's yeah. I'm 46. I uh, just turned no inkling. And I used to always tell people like, I don't know, maybe when I'm 50, I'll want to adopt it. I have never even had a moment. I think I like my life the way it is. I love, I love dogs. I love that kind of nurturing. Um, but no, I watch too much ID channel too. Chances of me raising a serial killer. It's like okay. 80%. <laughs> what about getting married? I almost did. Um, like this sky Marty. Okay. We dated like 20 years ago. And then we parted ways um and we almost did like we went to vegas a few weeks ago we were going to and then we both were like well we don't even need to like this is enjoyable uh wait literally a few weeks ago yeah we, yeah, we almost did <laughs> wait you dated 20 years ago and you almost got married a few weeks ago yeah like we reconnected i want to say okay. in june maybe okay um god this is the most i've ever talked i've like never talked about my stuff oh, but I'm yeah it, no 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 i no oh. it's totally not because i'm like oh uh yeah i if I do, I do. If I don't, I don't. I never have, again, it's not a thing I've ever visualized for myself. I don't have that. Oh, I see my wedding. Never, not once. So I like the idea of a partner in life, obviously. I, that that to me is beautiful and wonderful. And I enjoy that. But the other, the legality of it all does, is not necessary. So you did you go all the way to Vegas and then turn around? No, God, hell no. Okay. We stayed in Vegas. I love Vegas. <laughs> no, we no, but into I mean, a like, did you go to trip. the Little White Chapel uh, place? No, we, we had like booked it. Like we, and then we, yeah, we have, so we ended up turning it in and we had a party 
there was like an engagement party type thing. Um, okay. So you're engaged. Really a celebration. I mean, you know, I, I don't, that's just all weird to me. I'm so bad. I'm like a 12 year old boy. Like I'm like, yeah, I guess. But I like, I don't, you don't need rings. Like we just, just live. Wow. I, I almost feel like I think you jinx it when you start okay. to do like the, the official steps. And that's, that's totally my issue. But like, you know, you know, those couples that are amazing for 10 years, then they get married and they're divorced the next year. You're like, what? I don't understand what happened. So it's like, I'm almost scared that it's a jinx to do it, which I know it's not. I obviously have more friends that are married than aren't, but right. <laughs> it is. That's wild. Cause I, I listened to your new podcast and I heard the one that you did from Vegas. I correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember you saying you almost got married during. No, the... I never. No, I never. Wow. Yeah. This, is a, yeah. this is exclusive. Hawani exclusive right here. <laughs> yeah. Call the almost your post right now. <laughs> Yeah, this no, it's, it's funny because I don't, I never, I, even the other day at the Spurs game, like we're going into break and Sean Elliott takes his headphones off. He's like, did you get married? I'm like, <laughs> why do you even, why are you asking me that? <laughs> it was awesome. It was so cute. I was like, I did not know. I, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> okay. That is amazing. Um, just a couple more things and I'll let you go. And I really appreciate the time. This is oh, great. Oh, it's fine. Um, this is fly fly. <laughs> um, what are you most proud of that you've accomplished? Oh gosh. Um, Hmm. It's like one is shallow and one is like, I'm proud of me as a person. Like one is, look, I'm proud of financially what I did as a, as a woman in this business. And I, as stupid as that sounds and sad as that sounds, it actually is their markers and those markers had never been reached. And I, I feel good about that because hopefully that now becomes like a normal thing. Although I don't know. And secondly, I, I go to sleep at night knowing I've never, I haven't done anything to anyone else to make myself better. I haven't thrown anyone under the bus to, you know, make my career move a couple steps ahead or thinking that it would move my career a couple steps ahead. I, I'm honest about who I like, who I don't like. I don't, I don't see myself as fake. Um, I'm sure I've had to do fake smiles here and there. We all do. But as far as like genuine, I, I just don't. And it, I'm sure it makes some people think I'm an ass. Um, and that's fine. That just means that you're one of the people that I don't like, uh, and I'm okay with that. It's, it's, it's too hard to remember what you said and what you didn't say and what was true and what wasn't. And so I just figured just be honest and you don't have to remember anything. I, I sort of hate when people ask me like, what's the one thing you haven't done that you wish you could do or the show <laughs> that you could do? Because then like, I don't oh. want to be disrespectful to the people that I'm currently working with right. or be unappreciative, but I'm kind of going to break my rule here. Like, as I feel like you've checked off you know, pretty damn close to all the boxes. Yeah. Is there something maybe outside of the box that you would love to do? I mean, you ventured into entertainment, you, mm. you, you bet on yourself, you've gotten all the, the, the gigs over the years. And now I, I love, there is a bit of it, like an indie spirit to you now, which I appreciate. <laughs> is there yeah. something that you would love to do that is maybe out, you know, outside of what Gosh. we've known you for? Like I, I, I always thought, well, it used to be, I used to think the idea of late night, but late, I think over the years we've all in this business mm -hmm. realized it's just so hard. I mean, we've like, people have tried people much greater than I have tried and it just doesn't work. Um, because they make it all look so easy. All the late night hosts do. Uh, I love the idea of fun game shows. Like the Brits have so many, and it's also because their humor is so good. Um, they have ridiculous game shows, but really like now, if you, if you came to me and said the, the salary is not the issue, like, what do you want to do? I would want to do like an Anthony Bourdain style travel, food, sports, you know, live out of a suitcase, just go, just do as many experiences as I can from here until whatever, how much time I have. Um, that would be my, that'd be my dream. Like something different every day would be my dream. <laughs> I like that. I feel like that's attainable. If you have a good, you have a new agent now, I presume. I do. Yeah, I know. Okay. That was another thing. I had to do that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just all weird grown up stuff. I do not love. <laughs> um, la last thing for you. I feel like I've seen this clip and it's a tremendous clip. It's great that you have it. Um, I feel like we've seen it like a thousand times. It's you and Tony Parker sitting there when oh, you're fresh. Yeah. It's a beautiful clip. It's like, I mean, you've probably been in the business like 10 minutes at that point when you're totally. sitting there. Where are yeah. you? Are you in Paris with him or you're somewhere no, outside? No, it was in San Antonio outside oh. of, I want to say one of the local colleges, like on bleachers. <laughs> it's an amazing <laughs> was, clip. Um, oh, who knew? Yeah. Like, I think it's like probably at this point, maybe 20, 20 plus years ago, right? Yeah, because he was he was literally 18 and fresh off the plane. Like, wow. <laughs> if weird. you could tell that young woman something about the business, maybe what not to do, if you could give her some advice, what would you say to that young woman about uh, what's to come and, you know, maybe a little bit of advice about the, the waters that she's about to navigate? Yeah. Um, 
I wouldn't change anything. I think every single one of these things has been a learning experience. Um, none of it so detrimental that I, I'm affected for the long term. So that's okay. I think that's life. Uh, I would tell her to start investing earlier <laughs> because you never know. And I, I, not, I mean, just be yourself. Like, honestly, just be authentic. It might work. It may not, you know, not, it doesn't always work, but you will feel better in the long run because if you go into it with like this weird facade or persona that maybe it works, but then you're going to wake up one day and be like, I don't even know what, who am I? What did I do? What? I don't know who these people thought they hired. And you're always going to think like, when is the jig up? Like, when are they going to realize I've BS my way through this whole job? And I think that means you're doing a good job. Mm. <laughs> you're not taking it for granted because every day you're like, this is the day, this is the day they figure it out. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but I wouldn't I change anything. I love that you said be yourself because I feel like the one thing that like when I think of Michelle Beto, it's like, wow, she really is herself on TV. You know, like there are some people who you feel like are putting on an act or are just married to the prompter. And what I always appreciated right. about you on Sports Nation and then when you got to the, you know, the NBA scene with Countdown, I was like, I feel like you were never a prompter person. And I feel like your magic and your talent was that it always made it feel like for the viewer that they were just dropping into your conversation because you were so conversational with your style. And so- Thank you. No, really, you, uh, to me, you're one of the legends of this uh, business and I'm a huge <laughs> fan for life and uh, I appreciate everything that you've done. And honestly, I'm really happy that, and maybe you've just worked me as they say in the wrestling business for an hour, <laughs> but <I'm>, me. <laughs> you know that term, I'm happy yeah. that uh, you aren't bitter because one of my big fears when I left ESPN was, will I be bitter? Will I not watch ESPN? Will I not watch the games? You can't avoid the games. You can't. And, and I thought maybe because yours, I mean, you were there way longer than I was and your departure was, like I said, unceremonious. Um, I thought maybe you'd be bitter. It sounds like you don't harbor any bitterness and that is a pretty damn amazing thing. So much yeah. respect to you. And I hope people know that like when we talk about what's happened, like chapters of our lives, if just because it may sound like it was a negative moment and because it was, it doesn't mean you're bitter. Like you mm -hmm. cannot tell negative parts of life with a smile, like a stupid smile on your face. It is what it is. It's storytelling. Um, I think if you came out here and was like, I'm going to burn that place down one day, like that's, that's a different animal altogether, but you're right. You can't avoid it. They have the F1 races. So what am I going to do? What yeah. am I going to do? Not watch? <laughs> Ricardo's your guy, right? Uh, who, who can't, I mean, yeah, but this weekend is it's, I'm a Verstappen Big. girl this weekend. Uh, we Ricardo was actually on this show a couple weeks ago. He's I MMA know. Fan. Oh my God. What a gentleman. This guy shows up. Have you, you, have you met him? No, of course not. I'm like a, I'm like a, like a fan, super fan. Oh my God. I, I, I think I'd be nervous to be honest. You would become an even bigger fan if you met him. He shows up with two sets of headphones. He's like, which one sounds better? How's the lighting? How's the framing? He couldn't have been a nicer oh human God. being. I mean, like I, sometimes I forgot he showed up wearing a Bills jersey because he knows I'm a Bills fan. He was such a thoughtful, nice guy. We went 75 minutes and he's like, we can keep going. Like he has made, I'm not a big F1 guy. He has right. single-handedly made me, he is such a lovable human being. And I see you wearing the hat and the shirt and all that. So I, I think you picked the right guy. Like he gets it. He laughs at himself. Those are the best right. people on the planet, period. Amen. <laughs> like you. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much for the time. Good luck with the new ventures, with the Spurs, with The Athletic. I look forward to that travel show that you'll be doing in a few years. And, and our uh, radio show that'll be coming out someday. Yes, and that too. <laughs> and that too. And I wish you all the best and uh, good luck with the upcoming wedding as well. <laughs>